we're going to look in some commercial bank and learn how banks serve us. We'll find out how Nancy Wallace is helping herself and helping the bank to fulfill its purposes. By looking in on Frank Hamilton, we'll learn the meaning of credit. And by following along with Richard Morton, we'll see how bank credit serves the world of business. Behind the scenes, in the bookkeeping department, we'll be concerned with the bank's records of various depositors' accounts and with the bank's own balance sheet. Let's look at the balance sheet this way. When the bank started, its assets were only the cash contributed by the stockholders who organized the bank. This was balanced, on the ownership side, by the capital stock issued to the stockholders. Some of the cash assets were converted into a bank building and furnishings and special equipment. The bank was then ready to receive deposits. Here, Nancy Wallace is depositing $5 in her savings account. She probably thinks of this only as a means of helping herself, building up a reserve fund to meet future needs and emergencies by putting her money in a safe place where each deposit is insured up to a maximum of $10,000. Even so, she's helping her bank to serve her community. For she and hundreds of other depositors help to build up the amount of cash which the bank has available to conduct its business deposit appear on the other side of the balance as a liability because the bank must stand ready to return an equal amount of money on demand. Deposits in savings accounts are called time deposits because the depositors intend to leave the money in the bank for some time. But most of the deposits are demand deposits upon which the depositor can write checks when he makes payments to others. Such deposits are made in commercial or personal accounts often called checking accounts. Frank Hamilton is depositing some money and also a check, his paycheck. On the deposit slip, the amount of the money and the check are added together just as though it were all money. And yet, a check is not money. It is an instrument for the transfer of credit, which is a substitute for money. What does that mean? Well, how would you like to have to get up every morning in time to pay the milkman? Does this bother? The dairy sells its products on credit and at the end of the month sends a bill for the price of the milk delivered during the month. This is called personal credit or consumer credit. But now Mr. Hamilton still doesn't want to go to the dairy office to pay his bill. So he will mail them a check for the amount of money he owes them. And this is where the bank comes back into the picture. On his job, Mr. Hamilton himself is paid not in money, but by check. He deposits his paychecks in the bank. He receives no money for his work. But in the bookkeeping department of the bank, the amount of the deposit is credited to Mr. Hamilton's account. In other words, it is added to the amount of his credit in the bank. Meanwhile, the amount of the check is deducted from the amount of credit available to Mr. Hamilton's employer. Thus, the check has served as an instrument for the transfer of credit from the central manufacturing company to Mr. Hamilton. In addition to personal checks, there are several other types. A certified check is a personal check that is guaranteed by the bank on which it is drawn. A cashier's check is one drawn by a bank on its own funds in the bank. A bank draft is a check drawn by a bank on funds it has on deposit in another bank. By means of these various credit instruments, a bank deals much more in credit than it does in money. Now, a bank not only assists in the transfer of credit, but it also creates credit. To see how this is done, We'll follow Richard Morton into the loan department of the bank. Mr. Morton owns a hardware store in town. He has his bank account here, and he is well known to the officials of the bank as an honest, conscientious, capable businessman. He explains his business. He has recently purchased about $2,000 worth of goods for his store from the Central Manufacturing Company. To encourage prompt payment, the manufacturer offers him a discount if he pays the bill within 10 days. Mr. Morton would like to take advantage of this saving 
but right now he does not have enough spare cash or bank credit. He wants to borrow that much from the bank for 30 days. Since Mr. Morton is known to the bank as a reliable man, and since he has brought along records to show that the financial condition of his business is sound, the banker can feel reasonably certain that Mr. Morton will be able to repay the loan when it comes due. So the banker is glad to make the loan. Mr. Morton writes out a promissory note. This is a promise to pay the money back to the bank at a certain time, in this case, in 30 days. As so often happens in a bank, no money changes hands. The amount Mr. Morton has borrowed is simply credited to his account minus the interest which the bank charges for this service. When interest is deducted in advance, we call it discounting a note, and the interest is called discount. Other notes provide that the borrower receives the full amount and pays it back, plus interest. Either way, the interest that it collects on loans is one of the bank's principal sources of income. Now Mr. Morton has obtained his loan. He has increased his bank credit by nearly $2,000. But this credit was not transferred to him from some other account. So where did it come from? The bank always has on hand a reserve of money received from the stockholders and depositors. On the basis of these cash reserves, a bank can create credit. As a result of the loan to Mr. Morton, the asset, loans and discounts, is added. To balance this, the deposits figure is increased by the amount of the loan which is left with the bank. So, besides providing a safe place for depositing money and making it easy for people to transfer credit from one to another, a bank serves a community by making additional credit available for many purposes for a family to build a new home, for a merchant to enlarge and remodel his store, for a farmer to purchase new equipment, for a manufacturer to meet his payroll during slack selling periods, for a family to meet the cost of an expensive illness, and for many other good reasons why people are always needing more money, more credit, than they have immediately available. Since most of these transactions involve the transfer of credit rather than cash, they increase the bank's deposits much more than they decrease its cash. Consequently, the bank needs to keep comparatively little cash on hand. By proper timing, new loans are made at about the same rate that old ones are repaid. For instance, when Mr. Morton's customers pay their bills, he deposits their checks in his bank account. Most of the credit Mr. Morton borrowed from the bank he transferred to the central manufacturing company to pay his bill. His subsequent deposits build his credit up so that by the end of the 30-day period, he can repay the bank the credit he borrowed. In exchange for this check, he receives back his promissory note marked paid in full. Still, for all the work this credit has done, it has had little effect on the bank's cash. What then does the bank do with the rest of the cash the depositors have left with it? Some of it is put to work for the federal government, and in exchange for it, the bank holds bonds and other government obligations. Some of it is put to work for the community in which the bank is located, in exchange for municipal bonds and securities. Much of it goes to build up the industrial might of the nation, in exchange for corporate securities. And finally, some of the cash goes into Federal Reserve bank stock. Our Federal Reserve system serves as a banker's bank, facilitating the transfer of credit among member banks throughout the nation in the same way that each bank helps its customers to transfer credit. So, when Nancy Wallace deposited $5 in the bank, she was not only helping herself, she was helping the bank to create credit used in carrying on the business of her community and her country and her world. The credit, thus created, is far greater in amount than all the money in the world. And this credit is the cornerstone of our world structure of commerce and industry, working for us in the mass production of goods, in the transportation of goods throughout the world, in the building of our cities and towns and homes, in the giant works of our federal government, 
in the conveniences of daily living, and in the protection of our health and our lives. All this is done with credit, credit created by the bank out of the deposits made by all of us.